Hello. So in this video, we're going to talk about Keith Taylor's poetry collection, Marginalia for a Natural History. Now, I love this book. This is probably one of my favorite collections of poetry that I've ever read. Um, so, Keith Taylor, if you ever watch this video, two thumbs up from me. Absolutely fantastic. Um, so, as the title might suggest, this is nature poetry primarily and and that's one of my favorite genres of poetry so that's part of the reason that i like this so much um in particular taylor is interested in the resilience of nature the resilience of the natural world in the face of disaster or even in the face of the sort of everyday challenges of survival and so i want to read you a couple of poems that that show us this theme in action. Uh, the first one is called Not the Northwest Passage, and one of the things that you'll see is I, I'm going to read you four poems from this collection altogether over the course of this video, and one of the things that you'll see consistently is that these are very short poems, um, and so they're very easy to engage with, and that's actually I'll talk about that more in just a little bit. Uh, but this is called Not the Northwest Passage for Phil Myers. Just the white-footed mouse, delicate and doe-eyed, only 25 grams of unrelenting passion pushing north, a few feet each generation through duff on the forest floor, old logs or tunnels under deep snow, always north, attacking the necessary and impenetrable wall of cold. So we have that of struggle for survival kind of element here. Um, we have that running up against what seems like it should be an impenetrable boundary. Uh, the the very small mouse, this, this tiny creature that keeps going in spite of all odds. Um, and the other one I want to want to read you in terms of this sort of theme of um, nature, the natural world, plants, animals, uh, overcoming obstacles or overcoming challenges is the poem Signs and Wonders. First flicker drumming on a dead ash at the tail end of a harsh winter, we've learned to cling to these simple things, forgetting for only a moment emerald green ash borders killing the trees, Starlings chasing woodpeckers from their holes, or the garlic mustard that will sprout in profusion below. So again, we've got this sense of rebirth at the end of a, a harsh winter, but it's in it's an interesting poem because it's not simply a sort of celebration of spring and life and renewal and whatever it is. It's also a more complicated thing. Because in this, we have life taking on multiple forms. We have uh, the garlic. Uh, da, 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 da. Sorry, I lost the page. Um, I mean, we have the garlic mustard. We have the ash borers, which, while they're they're natural and they're sort of uh, a component of this world. They are also they're also a threat to other components of this natural world. The starlings chasing woodpeckers from their holes. We've got these complex interactions of nature. But then the other thing that really characterizes this collection and this this approach to nature poetry is a kind of most Zen Buddhist uh, style, something that I would associate with. Uh, a haiku master like Basho, the Japanese poet, um, this way of depicting nature or of depicting very simple images, things like this, on in a style that seems very direct and very observational, as though the author is just describing something that's happened without commenting on it. But the, act, the poem itself actually 
uh, the, that very style, the choice of the way in which that imagery is presented becomes really significant, and it, it carries all of these resonances. So I'm going to read you two poems that I think exemplify this style. Uh, the first is Pathetic Fallacies, Early May. If they could talk, I think the new leaves of the Japanese lilac bushes by the back window might say they're pleased to receive the rain this cold morning. There are few things worse than a spring drought, for lilacs anyway. But when drops hit a leaf, it springs back, recoiling as if slapped often before, afraid. So there is a little bit of a haiku sound to the to these poems, uh, but they're clear. I mean, they're clearly not haiku. They're they're clearly much longer than haiku, although they're still relatively short poems. But one of the things that someone like Basho does in his poetry is gives us these observations of natural events that sound simple and straightforward, but they they encode messages about the interconnectedness of life or, or of existence or about um, the impact that even a simple action can have on those around us or things around us um, about the dualistic nature of, of good and evil for instance so like in this poem pathetic fallacies early may which I actually think is one of my favorite poems of the whole collection this notion that like the Japanese lilac bushes are going are, are grateful for this nourishing rain, but in this la these last two lines, uh, we have the drops. La I'll get the last two and a half lines, but when drops hit a leaf, it springs back, recoiling as if slapped off often before, afraid. So the rain that brings life, the rain that brings relief from this. Uh, spring drought is also in some sense threatening. So we have that sort of dualistic nature of, of uh, existence here, that, that dualistic component of uh, the natural world. The other one that I want to read that I think is very much in this Zen vein is called Once in This Life. At the Aransas Refuge, I watched a whooping crane, at least five feet tall with an eight-foot wingspan, black wingtips, male, one of the last few hundred left on Earth, dip its head into the reeds. I saw a drop of brackish water form on his perfect bill, glisten the once in the sun, and then fall back to the swamp. So actually, as I was reading this, one of the things that occurred to me is that the poems often have a turn. Um, so this is a, a poetic term, uh, really that's used, uh, that comes from sonnet writers. There's actually a term for it in a haiku. The, when the, the last, the third line of a haiku sort of shifts the focus or, or uh, changes what we're, what we're getting out of the poem. But I can't remember the Japanese term off the top of my head. Um, so in sonnets, it's called a turn, where we have a shift, and so suddenly some the poem, a different meaning of the poem is revealed, and this is what a lot of Taylor's poems do in this collection. They have this kind of turn, and we have that really well uh, illustrated here. Is the first, the first five lines that make up the opening portion of the poem, are about the crane itself and describing the crane and establishing it, its rarity, the last three lines shift our attention. I saw a drop of brackish water form on his perfect bill, glisten once in the sun, then, then fall back to the swamp. So here we have the shift to a very small thing, to this drop of water, and Again, what we have sort of illustrated here is the interconnectedness of existence. The crane, the water, the swamp all become sort of interwoven in this image, reflecting reflecting how deeply dependent they are on one another for existence. <laughs> 